Paradiso, Canto 8. Canto 8 is dedicated to love. Symbolized in the mythological figure of Venus and the planet that is named after her. It is important that at the outset to distinguish four meanings of love as they come down to us from the classical ages of which the Divine Comedy is a, is a part and which are evident in the various stages of this canto and the order of which will form my discussion. First of all, lust, which is desire for sexual fulfillment, a savage carnal appetite. Next, eros, which is aspiration, desire or longing for the beloved, seeking for the union, deeper communion with the beloved. Next, philia, which is mutuality or friendship. And finally, agape, which is free, selfless, self-giving. A word about Venus. From antiquity, there has been a, a distinction between the celestial Venus and the earthly Venus. For Dante, Beatrice is clearly the heavenly Venus. Let's go to lust. This canto opens by stating the error made by ancient people, Greeks and Romans alike, that Venus, quote, beamed rays of maddened love, quote, that she was the earthly Venus, it, it, inciting a carnal abandoned relative to which we find in Plato's Phaedrus the following, quote, he looks at her earthly namesake, and instead of being awed at the sight of her, he is given over to pleasure. And like a brutish beast, he rushes on to enjoy and beget. He consorts it with wantonness and is not afraid or ashamed in pursuing pleasure in violation of nature. This description of lust or the savage carnal appetite fits Dido, cited here in this canto, as well as in Canto V of the Inferno. Dido, who is in hell for her excessive passionate love for Aeneas. This description also fits Kunitsa da Romano in Canto 9, her having a long life of love affairs and various marriages. Indeed, Dante himself seems at one time to have been infected with this kind of erotic madness. As Beatrice testifies in Purgatorio, what, quote, when I had risen to spirit from my flesh, to him I was less clear, less dear, and less pleasing. Because, quote, he set his steps upon an untrue way, pursuing those false images of good that bring no promise to fulfillment, such that, quote, he sank so low that every instrument for his salvation now fell short. Here we have an echo of St. Augustine in his third book of the Confessions. To Carthage I came, where I immersed myself in a cauldron of unholy loves. Now to Eros. Dante was not aware that he was ascending to Venus, the third heaven, until he sees Beatrice shining there even more beautiful. And his ascent toward her is evident in his raising his eyes to her. Ascent is powered by Eros, by longing. Eros is ecstatic, that is, in the sense that Dante stands out from himself, that Dante transcends his very self, seeking in his ascent a further communion, a deeper union with the heavenly person of Venus, with Beatrice, and not with the earthly Venus of his earlier years, nor with Lady Philosophy, as in his work, The Convivio, the first line of which is cited in this canto. No, no, no. It is Beatrice for whom he yearns, and through her, and, as stated in Canto 10, beyond her with God. In Canto 13, Dante speaks, quote, of the ardor of bringing, of, excuse me, of longing in my soul. And in Canto 1, he describes longing as the primal impulse, which could only be, quote, diverted by false pleasure. His ascent toward God is thus mediated in this canto by Beatrice and the dance of the seraphim, the order of angels closest to God who burn with the fire of love that appears that appear in a light within which there are other swirling lights, including the cherubim, angels glowing with splendor of intelligence, and the, the thrones, angels standing by the steadfastness of judgment. This ascent is also reminiscent of that of St. Augustine. Quote, Late have I loved you, O beauty, ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. 
You were, with, you were within me, but I was outside, and it was there that I searched for you. You breathed your fragrance on me. I drew in breath, and now I pant for you. I have tasted you. Now I hunger and thirst for more. Let's turn to Philea, friendship. One of the approaching, swirling heavenly lights is discovered by Dante to be Charles Martel, who expresses profoundly to Dante the love that is their, their reciprocal friendship. Quote, you loved me well and with good reason. Had I remained below to you, I would have shown much more than mere fonds, fronds of my affection. Charles asks Dante whether the human is by nature social, to which Dante says there is no need. He has no need for proof of that. Friendship is rooted in our social nature, is natural to the human rendering reciprocity more or less intensive by the free use of the will. To be truly social is not to be greedy, not to be stingy, as Charles describes his brother Robert and his cohorts who, quote, set their hearts on filling up their coffers, echoing, quote, the bad governance of their grandfather that led the populace of Palermo to a rebellion that has come to be known as the, as the Sicilian Vespers of 1289, by which Charles's family, the Angevins, lost Sicily forever. Charles claims that, quote, had he not met with an early death, much evil would have been diverted. In his desire for a restoration of a Roman emperor, Dante supported Charles's claim before his death, and then supported Henry VII's claim, which Robert's, Robert's brother uh, with, Charles, with Robert, Charles's brother, opposed. And even though so sociality cherishes and depends upon diversity, as is evident in the case of the non-Christian examples cited by Charles of Solon, Xerxes, Melchizedek, and Daedalus, it does not force people in, quote, roles unsuited to them, such as making a king one suited to be a priest. The long discourse by Charles in this canto, reflects clearly Dante's desire for political justice that renders an enduring friendship possible. Finally, let us go to agape, selfless, free, self-giving. This form of love is found in divine providence. It is, quote, the love that moves the sun and all the other stars. That is the last line of paradise. In Canto 8, it is portrayed through the analogy of the, the divine archer whose bow impels all things to their proper end, their proper end, which is God himself, whom Dante describes here in this canto as the primal intellect or mind, as the good itself, the beginning and end of all that he has created and sustains by means of his infinite love. Charles argues that if this divine providence, her purposiveness, were not so. The heavens you traverse and the angels that control them would engender such effects as would not seem crafted, but chaotic. Relative to Charles's portrayal of his brother Robert, this description of divine love or providence is Charles's response to Dante's question, quote, how can from sweet seed may come a bitter fruit. And Charles concludes that his brother Robert, through his own free will, has acted contrary to the right order of nature, contrary to providence, as, quote, one whose path departs from the true way. In conclusion, in Canto VIII, Dante teaches us the erotics of loving God. That in each of us there is the love that is eros, the desire for further union, and deeper communion with the beloved. He teaches that Eros is the passion for the infinite, the passion for the absolute, for him who is the very source and goal of all of our purposive strivings, mediated by a friend of the heart, Charles Martel per Dante, and by the heavenly Venus, by Beatrice. Beatrice who calls us and leads us for that beauty that is beyond her beauty, that love that powers and directs the universe 
to its end. Lord God, 